And good morning and welcome to the first ever episode of the North Carolina History Theater video blog. And uh, I'm Bill Hand, your host, and along with me is my fellow host, Mr. Per Erickson. Good morning, Mr. Erickson. And good morning, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kathy. <laughs> and yes, we have our guest, uh, Kathy Morrison, from the New from the New Bern Historical Society. Good morning, Kathy. Yes. And uh, tell you just a little bit first off what we are about. Um, we are a new theater in the area. We are a history theater, not a typical show theater. And uh, we got our 501c3 just back around July or August thereabouts, as I recall. And uh, we thank especially Mr. Buzzy Stubbs and his law firm for gathering that for us and giving us such a great deal on it. If you've got some uh, needs down there, make sure you go down there and check them out. And um, our, our general purpose is to present the history and the culture of North Carolina. That's the first thing we do. Uh, we are also here to present American history in general, although North Carolina history comes by far first, because that's what we want you all to know. Uh, since as though so many of you uh, elders are coming down into our city and our area when, on their retirement days, we are one of the hot spots in retirement down here in, in New Bern and uh, Craven County. And we're also doing some classical theater, some of the older plays you don't see so often in regular theater companies. And in that way, we're trying to avoid stepping on the toes of the other very fine theaters in our community. We have the Civic Theater and we have the Rivertown Theater, both which do some excellent, excellent productions. And uh, we hope you can find a way to support every one of us. Mm -hmm. Here, here. So today, we're going to start right out with what day it is. We have a couple of holidays coming up uh, starting today. Yesterday was a Marine's birthday. Uh, happy belated birthday to the Marine Corps. And, Pear, tell us a little bit about the day we're looking at today, the big day. Well, uh, today is, is Veterans Day, uh, the, the 11th of November. And initially, it, it started out as Armistice Day, uh, commemorating the armistice, which, which ended World War I, uh, which occurred on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month uh, in uh, uh, 1918. Uh, and Armistice Day was, was set up basically to uh, commemorate World War I. After World War II, uh, in 1954, it became Veterans Day. And uh, it is a day that commemorates and celebrates the bravery and sacrifice of all U.S. veterans, um, uh, whether they uh, served uh, in action or, or otherwise. Now, it's important, I think, to uh, for, for people to realize that Memorial Day and Veterans Day are obviously are two different, very different things. Very yes. different things. Memorial Day honors the service of members who died uh, in the service to their country mm -hmm. as a result of injuries incurred uh, during battle. Uh, but Veterans Day is set aside to thank and honor living veterans who served honorably in the military and in wartime talking. and peacetime. And I think it's important uh -huh. also to note that veterans is plural. There's no apostrophe S. Yes, you, uh, you caught my attention, my, my writerly part of me, yes. caught particular attention to that. That's all I'm thinking about now. Yes, uh, yes, yes. And that includes Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard. Yes. Uh, even the Merchant Marines have been recently accepted in the last few years in as they, that list, as, as they certainly deserve to be. As they, uh, as they, as they should be. I suppose now our Space Force as well. We've got one of those going yes. too. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, of course, as you mentioned yesterday, it was the 246th birthday of the United States Marine Corps. Uh, our son served in the uh, in the mm -hmm. Marine Corps, and uh, since the Marine Corps birthday. Uh, falls on November 10th, uh -huh. and Veterans Day is on November 11th. Uh, it is also important to note that usually the Marines get a 96-hour liberty, there too, we go. so that so that they can <laughs> so that they can celebrate uh, both both yes, I, uh, both dates. My father was a a Marine. He spent three years in the Marines, four years in the Army. I believe as a, a sergeant back at the tail end of World War II. Um, his actual fighting, any fighting he did was in China, where he said they would be building roads and they'd protect the nationalists as they built the roads, and the communists would sit back and wait. And once the road was done, then they'd move in and take over. So they're pretty After smart the about road that. Was built, that yeah. <laughs> That's, were they dummy? No, they were not no. dumb. Um, back in the day, I mean, the training is not to, today. The training is very specific, very entrenched. Uh, and, and whatnot. I wrote an old column once. We interviewed a man who was here in Newburn, 
and we actually lived down in Atlantic, but uh, he had served here in 1941 at the beginning of the war, and uh, he and I got pretty close for a while. He, he passed away back in 2013. But uh, this, this gentleman was one of the soldiers at Camp Battle. Now, if you don't know where Camp Battle is, Camp Battle is where you now know as Glen Burnie Park. And at the start of World War One, Glen Burnie Park became Camp Battle. It wasn't a park until long after, actually. It was just farmland at the time. And these soldiers were stationed there to be guards. And they would guard parts of the city, uh, such as the, uh, the, the bridge that went across uh, from Johnson Street at the time and things like that. And they spent some time here before they went on to fight the war in Asia and saw quite a bit of uh, action in the Pacific Theater. And of course at that time, if you don't know this, I never knew this until I moved down here, but there were German prisoners of war all over America. And uh, we were not the main camp in the state, that was up in Raleigh and I think in one of those big forts. <laughs> I can't remember which one now. But in any case, New Bern had its own camp. About 400 German POWs stayed here. And uh, during the war, farmers would rent them out. Uh, they'd go in town doing masonry work, whatever else. The fact was, we had all these Americans overseas and fighting, and we had a labor shortage, and we only had so many rosy riveters stepping forward, so we used prisoners of war. And uh, we had lots of empty troop carriers coming back from Europe, and Europe was running out of room to put all these thousands of prisoners they had, and so that's how they got here. But it was interesting, he told me a little bit about how the training he did, and I want to read just, it's a fairly short column, a little bit about that, if that's all right with everybody. And he said, often, early in the Civil War, um, and so, yes, often early in the Civil War, trainees learned to drill sticks instead of guns. So I was a little surprised, though, when I learned that something very similar happened as recently as World War II. Although when the war broke out, Robert McCall, that was my friend, was a Philadelphia boy. He joined the 11th Infantry Regiment in Pennsylvania, the same one started by Benjamin Franklin, by the way, and wound up spending the first year of the war at Camp Battle, where New Bern's Glen Burnie Park stands today. Robert lives today, or he did, in the coastal village of Atlantic, not too far from Cedar Island Ferry. He met his wife Frances, a daughter of the blueberry farmers in Bridgeton during his time in town. He would talk about how they would walk across the bridge and they'd all have dates over there with the young ladies, especially the blueberry ladies, and uh, paint the town red over there. Back then they actually had a little bit more business than they do now. Uh, I went to visit this charming couple last year while most of our talk was about his actual time in New Bern. He spent a few minutes discussing his early training with the 11th, most of which took place in South Carolina. At the time, everybody didn't have weapons, he said. The soldiers played war games and often substituted their weapons. Four-inch stovepipes became bazookas, for instance. The men would also take old Model A car chassis and mount more stovepipe on top of that. They'd haul that around the back of a jeep and that was supposed to be a cannon. In these training games, regiments were divided into opposing armies. They'd go at each other in mock warfare. The Red Army, in one exercise, had some light tanks. They'd have umpires, you know, Robert recalled, to say, you're dead, and to a tank, they'd say, they just hit you with a bazooka, you're out of action. He remembered a particular corporal named Davies. He was so gung-ho, you'd think that he was a drill sergeant. Davies was not only into the spirit of a fight, he was into the spirit of grabbing up any local items to substitute for the real thing. This corporal took a clump of old red clay, Robert said, and he threw it at the tank. A hand grenade, you know, in that clay, with that clay, and in that particular tank, propped opening in the turret was the tank commander who was overseeing the Red Army's cavalry. Sure enough, that chunk of uh, mud hit that guy right in the head, and the last Robert saw of him, he was being chased across the field by a tank. Mm. So there you go, a little story of the trading days of World War II early on. <laughs> and Bill, I, I think it's important to note that here in, here in, in Craven County, we have 20,000 veterans. 20,000 veterans. That's, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's, really, that's really quite amazing. Also, uh, just one more thing I'd like yep. to note that I saw in, the, saw in the news today that it is exactly 100 years ago today that the first soldier was interred at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in Arlington uh, Cemetery. And uh, present for that were, were President uh, Harding at the time, mm -hmm. General John Pershing, and General John Lejeune. And there you go, that nice. Lejeune name may be very familiar to, to our listeners here and our watchers. And uh, Pershing, of course, was our MacArthur of World War One. Mm. And some of you are saying MacArthur. 
<laughs> and General Lejeune commanded the, all, all the Marine, the right, American Marines. Right. And, the, and as a, a little tiny thing, a camp battle in New Bern was not named after warfare. It was named after a Civil War general who had fought and uh, gained his generalship after his heroism at Gettysburg. And he never lived here. He was uh, not, not during his war days. But his son moved up here to New Bern after the war. And... Uh, took on business, and eventually Dad decided, I'm getting old, I need someone to take care of me, and he came to New Bern for two, and so they named the camp after him. Welcome, Simon Spaulding. <laughs> Good hey, to be Simon. here. Good morning. <laughs> He's kind of snuck in here on us. He is, he is our official. We are about, in this show, by the way, we are about uh, theater. We are about the arts in general. We are about history, and if there's anyone who uh, embraces both and defines both, it is Simon Spaulding with his... <laughs> Vast historical knowledge, and his. Uh, this man once talked to me for a solid half hour about the history of bowler hats. He, and I, I remember that greatly. I said, "The bowler hats happened in this time," and I got the longest lecture on the change of the bowler hats over twenty years. It, only thirty minutes. It's only thirty <laughs> I minutes. I think I was trying to. Come it was down. one of your short days. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, that, that's how that conversation went. But uh, we're going to move on to our next little subject, and that is the New Bern Historical Society. Kathy, tell us what's going on. Uh, New Bern Historical Society always has a lot of interesting things going on. Um, you know, for us, our, our mission is to celebrate and promote New Bern and its heritage through events and education, and we celebrate. And a lot of events. The for, next one coming up is coming up this Sunday, November the 14th. Okay. Uh, Rodney Kemp is going to, uh, going to be at, at Oringer Auditorium at uh, Freeman Community College at 2 o'clock. He's a, a wonderful storyteller, a historian, and he's going to present his uh, Gentle on My Mind, is what he calls it, and it's a collection of stories and histories from coastal Carolina. Now, from the literature I've heard, some he's a bit of a humorist. He is. He's a humorist, a historian, uh, just really delightful character, uh, and, and, and someone who, you know, you sit down to listen to him, and, and pretty soon, you know, two hours are gone and you don't even know it. Um, really an interesting guy. And uh, he's going to be there on Sunday, so we invite invite everybody out there to, to come and see. Okay, uh, sounds there like still are time. tickets available. You can get them at uh, at uh, slash tickets Or if you're not into all the W's, you can just pick up the telephone. That's that little thing with there the you handset. Go. Yeah, six three eight eight five five eight, and call the historical society, and you can still get your space on Sunday to hear Rodney. Okay. Uh, very popular. Uh, we have been trying for a while to get him to come up here, and, and now we're thrilled that he's here and looking forward to hearing him on Sunday. That's good. Now, how did the ghost walk go, by the way? Ghost Give us a little feel on how that, all there, that went. Uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the fella sitting across from me was, was well involved in ghost walk <laughs> and has been for 30 years or so. Yes, uh, I, it makes me feel so old. 20, uh, 26 years. 26 ghost 26 walk. Years. Man, 26, yeah, 26 man. years. Wow. Uh, Ghost Walk was great. Folks loved it. Great result. Uh, the the rain on Thursday, you know, from my point of view, where I was working, because I was <laughs> I was working at the uh, we did the tap snap photos with the green screen for everybody, and from where I was working, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to keep people away. And you know, at the end yep. of the day, people liked being in the cemetery in the rain. Oh, really? The ghosts, I'm Thanks. sure, were not thrilled. <laughs> but, the, no, but, never. but the patrons loved it. Yes, I, I remember one year in the cemetery where I run the cemetery, and they're part of the cemetery anyway, and it was just pouring rain all night. And it was like in the 40s and pouring rain. Oh. And we had this young teen girl who was doing a part. And every 10 minutes, I'm getting a phone call from her saying, Mr. Hand, can we please stop now? <laughs> it's like, no, I'm sorry. No. There's still people coming. Yeah. Well, we had a, a little rain on That's, Thursday. Mm -hmm. And Friday and Saturday were wonderful. Folks, folks, great just weather. really, you know, great response from everybody. Loved the stories. Uh, all the things mm -hmm. that were going on with it, the ghosts on the porch, the ghosts in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. uh, for those folks that don't know, ghosts in Ghost Walk are not scary monster ghosts. <laughs> ghosts in Ghost Walk are historic characters. Mm -hmm. And we bring them back from the past into present day and let them tell you their stories. Yeah, and some are fairly serious, some are pretty lighthearted. You get a, little good, a, a nice variety of all styles and some very talented actors. Right, it, it just... Um, you know, we, we just had the wrap-up yesterday, and it was, uh, uh, you know, just a, a great event. 
<laughs> and as always, we look at what we can do better next time, and so we'll make it even better next year. There you go. But that was, you know, very pleased with Ghost Walk, and thank you, Bill, for all your work with that and writing yeah. and directing and, <laughs> and all the other good things. I, I kind of got dragged into that way back when uh, Marie Infinito was the uh, one who ran the cemetery the first year I got into it, I think in 95 or 96. And she also ran a little theater company called Tea Time Theatricals, and she would do reader's theater. I mean, we would actually, you'd perform as though you were on stage, but you'd have this book in your hand, because most of our actors were really decrepit old people who can't memorize anything, like me. Uh, <laughs> I take but in any case, we that, do so that's how I Present do Present company accepted, of yes. course. <laughs> she asked me to come into it and uh, do something in the cemetery, then it turned out I couldn't get into the cemetery, so I went around town dragging my little, at the time, three-year-old daughter in a wagon, muddied her up, and put on a fireman's suit, because it was 1922 fire that time, and mm -hmm. apparently somebody reported me as a homeless man to the Historical Society, I understand. Oh, my goodness. But uh, at the end of that, Marie looked at me and said, well, I'm done this year, it's yours now. Oh, good. It's like, and you, and oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> I think it was your daughter's acting yeah. ability that got you. It, uh, no <laughs> doubt, no <laughs> doubt. Yeah. Well, we're glad glad to have you on board. And um, in, a, in answer to your question, Ghost Walk was great. And you all come again next year. There we go. We got, got one other thing coming up for Historical Society on the 20th, which is next weekend, Saturday mm -hmm. next weekend. Uh, we have a living history at the battlefield. That your folks from the 5th and the 7th North Carolina Infantry Regiments are going to set up a, a camp, an encampment, and uh -huh. they will be there. And they have uh, invited the public to come on Saturday the 20th. It'll be open. It'll be free. They're going to have their camp set up, but then they're also going to do some presentations. Um, they're going to do uh, uh, drills and activities, but they will also do some scenarios, uh, a payroll, a surgeon uh, working on uh -huh. a soldier, uh, and they also will have a presentation of a, of a vivandière, which is a word I had to look up. A vivandière is a sutler. All right. <laughs> it's a word I'm not even going to attempt it's to pronounce. It's, it's and, female, too. Yeah, and, and she's going to talk sorry. about women spies in the Civil War. Uh, so this is open I, to I sense Ms. Pickett making an instance. Yes, I, I would expect so. Uh, it's at Battlefield Park, Newburn mm -hmm. Battlefield Park, is right outside Taberna, if you've never been there. Head, head down 70 to the Dunkin' Donuts and turn right into Taberna. Yes. And immediately across the railroad track, turn left, and you'll see Battlefield Park Pavilion in front okay, of Okay, now, now the battlefield itself is, um, oh, it's where the Battle of New Bern was fought in March, what was the 1862. date? 1862. Yeah, it was 1862. March 14th. 14th. And uh, we were kind of badly outnumbered on the Confederate side. The Union came in, they captured the town. Uh, they managed to, I believe a battle was won when they managed to flank them. Yeah, they, right in the area a, where the battlefield park is yeah, today. There was a gap in the line because of how they lined up, and mm -hmm. the, the Union guys got around the gap and yeah. took hold of the artillery. And, and the if I recall, the general intelligently chose the local militia that had almost no training yes. to defend that spot. Yeah, so. That was what was available. Yeah. yeah was so. almost, mo most of the, the, the well equipped and well trained people had all been sent up to Virginia, mm -hmm. part of the Army. Yeah, North Carolina was always uh, got. We, we sent the most guys into the war, and we got the least defense. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of things went into the outcome of that battle that day, and as mm -hmm. a result of the Union victory, you know, it, it affected how how New Bern is today. Yeah, the yes, Union much, uh, we, we became an armed camp our, for our the pathway. Union. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so you all are invited to the battlefield. Yes. Yes. And, <laughs> You want to look up Emmeline Pickett, by the way. She was a famous spy from down around Carteret County, I believe. But she spent some time locked up in the Jones House on the uh, Trump President's Ryan Palace complex uh, after she was arrested as a spy. And they actually have her carriage and her dress down at the History Place wow. in Moorhead City the at the museum there. Dress with all the pockets there. in it hide, for hiding all the stuff. I'm not sure if it's that dress. They say it is her dress. Whether mm -hmm. it's that exact dress, I don't know. It could well be. But they've got her carriage and her dress. And if you go down there, I believe you can go in there. To, I don't think there's any charge to go in there. It's an interesting little museum. A little tiny right. thing. But it's, it's an interesting museum there. Cool. But anyway, so we invite mm -hmm. you to, to check out the New Britain Historical Society. We're online and do a whole lot of interesting, fun things, and invite you to come mm -hmm. along. And the battlefield is open anytime for anyone any to walk in. For those us. of you who are new in town and know, don't know about the Historical Society, uh, tell us a little bit about the Atmore Oliver House, wherever you, on Broad Street. Yeah, where, 511 where Broad Street. The Atmore Oliver House is in the same family 
from uh, the late 1700s until 1951, I believe, when Miss Mary Oliver died. Uh, and it's, you know, like all of the houses here, it started out with half of what's there now and expanded uh, in the early 1800s. Mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Historical Society was able to buy it from the heirs of the family. Uh, as I say, Miss Mary Oliver was the last one to live there. She was an interesting character. Um, that uh, that uh, there are lots of stories, and I'm, I'm looking at Bill thinking there will be good stories coming <laughs> from him about, about Miss Mary. Um, but we, the, the famous uh, story of Miss Mary and the Cat Heads. And, yes, the Cat Heads, um, which uh, yes, she apparently at that point was, was uh, an elderly lady who was uh, grouchy and didn't like cats and told the, the handyman to get rid of them, and he got rid of them and, and uh, put them in the ground with just their heads showing. So, yeah. Yeah. Something about her not paying him, he was getting yes. revenge or something like so that, as I recall. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, you know, we'll all get to that point in our lives when we're grouchy and, and, and do strange <laughs> things. Yeah. Hopefully not, we'll not get, quite to that we'll point. Get, but, uh, <laughs> 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 if he was get off my lawn or I'll bury your cat. But the Edward Oliver is, is, is yeah. interesting. It's where the Historical Society has their offices. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are an, uh, our collection is there as well. And uh -huh. in non-COVID times, I'd say go on over there and take a look at all of the things that we have in our collection. Uh, but now give us a call first before you come. <laughs> um, um. Uh, uh, the, the collection is, is, you know, like seven or 8,000 pieces. No, they're not all on display. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, some display areas and some office areas. You've got some battle flags. Uh, yeah, we have. A case a, full of bullets. Yeah. And, and just, you know, interesting mm -hmm. pieces, family pieces from the Atmore and Oliver families that date into the early 1800s. All right. Um, it's it's you know, an interesting collection and a, and an interesting collection uh, also on the walls of, of prints and uh, newspaper articles of the time and things mm -hmm. like that. Okay. So. Now, uh, the people of this table, by the way, we have, we have an event coming up at the North Carolina History Theater. And uh, while I'm at that exact little topic, anybody out there who has anything to do with we are arts and we are history on this program, and if you have any thoughts, any ideas, we're always going to be looking for interesting people and to interview interesting things to talk about. And uh, whether, I don't care if you're running the live nativity scene at the church or a high school play or a uh, local theatrical drama, if, if you've got an interesting historical story of your own or an organization, let us know. Let us know on the Facebook and uh, message us. and. We will give you a call. We'll probably set you up and bring you on over. So uh, you're looking for entertainment. Entertainment, entertainment, interesting arts, uh, painting, photos, what, whatever. We are wide open for that, and our only requirement is you not be as boring as a a sheet of fabric, or if you are, at least be a colorful sheet of fabric. <laughs> <clears throat> Although again, there there might be something special in being the one show that helps you get more sleep. <laughs> so so that, even, even that works. Anyway, the folks gathered around me here, um, I almost called you Michelle. I have no <laughs> idea why. Kathy and Pear are both uh, board directors and members on the uh, board of directors with the North Carolina History Theater, and they are vital to it. I am the president of the organization. And then also connected to, uh, Simon is not on the board because he wasn't crazy enough to say yes, <laughs> but he is the um, musician who wrote the music for our program coming up in April, and that is the Honor Play, which we presented uh, once upon a time in the past. And so back in January of 2020 is when we presented Slipped right under the COVID. Uh, Just barely beat the COVID. Barely. In fact, we all suspect that our uh, John Stanley had COVID during the show. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh, he spent one of her performances miserably sick and hiding in isolation, only coming out to do his work on stage and then went back into hiding again until the next scene. Well, that's when we didn't know it's, so much about it. Uh, no, we kept that quiet. No, I mean, we didn't know <laughs> didn't so much about COVID. It, uh, yeah. We just didn't we know. Didn't know, we yeah. didn't know about COVID at the time, but he had the symptoms it could have been. He might have had, it might, he may have just had a pretty bad flu or something, yeah. but he was miserably sick for a few days. and. Oh. Uh, are we going to do that again? Yes, we are. Uh, not the COVID part. No, uh, not the COVID part. <laughs> but we have a show coming up in April. Remind me of the dates because I don't have it in front of me. Pear, what are, what are they? April 21st uh, and uh, through 24th, and then April 30th and May 1st of 2022. Yes, and this will be at Oregon Auditorium. And uh, what we're doing, we're doing a, the last week we're doing 
uh, two performances on Saturday and a performance on Sunday because the theater, the stage we're using is already booked for that Friday. But uh, that gives you two matinees and all the people do like that afternoon performance. And uh, when you're on stage, it's very tiring to get through a play, but you've got the energy to rebuild up again for that night. So I think we'll do, we'll do fine. It's easy for me to say because I'm directing it and sitting in the audience. <laughs> But, uh, are you getting ready for it already? We are. We are indeed. Um, we have tryouts coming up that we're yes. putting together our cast. That's exactly right. On uh, mm -hmm. uh, November 18th, a week from today, uh, we're having our first auditions uh, from 3 to 5 in the afternoon and then from 7 to 9 in the evening. And uh, anybody and everybody, not everybody, <laughs> but, but anybody who is, who is really, really up for it uh, is invited to mm -hmm. come and to audition for any part. Yes. Uh, we'd like you to memorize, if you can, uh, and hopefully you can, a one-minute <laughs> monologue uh, to sing, if you can, uh, a folk song, either American, I know I sang an Irish folk song. Yeah, but uh, Irish American, yes, so we can yes, go with yes, that. Yes. Uh, I bet Simon has suggestions. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I, yes, I imagine Simon is, is uh, loaded with them. Yeah. Sing a song you know. <laughs> Sing a song you know, yes. How about Yankee Doodle? Is so, that close enough? Yeah, and you might have to do a cold Absolutely. reading. We'll see. Yes, yes, yes. But, uh, uh, a cold reading. Now, we're also, this is open to adults of all ages, mm -hmm. but, but we, are, we are also asking uh, for two boys to show up. Uh, uh, we need someone to play the son of... Richard Spade, mm -hmm. uh, a boy from uh, between the ages of five and eight, and an African American boy yes. between the ages of eight and twelve uh, to uh, play the son of Sarah. Yes, and they both yeah. both roles have lines. Uh, yes. Both are on stage several times. Of course, the uh, son of Sarah, the, the slave boy, he has uh, more lines than the younger one. But uh, yes, it's yes. they're both very interesting little roles. Yes, that's on the eighteenth. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, November 18th, next Thursday, mm -hmm. from 3 to 5 in the afternoon and from 7 to 9. And then also oh. on Saturday, November 20th, from uh, 12 to 2. So there are three chances. Yes. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's all out at the Oranger, Oranger, Oranger yeah. Auditorium of the Craven Community College campus in New Bern. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing anybody who comes, you, whether you've got experience or not. And... Uh, Especially if you can sing, we're trying to fill out our singers, and if you've got a good singing voice, we want you. We, we need you. Yeah, but yes. if you don't have a good singing voice, audition anyway. That's right. Simon yeah. Yeah. Yes, Absolutely. yes. We're we're talking a story of Newburn. Uh, if you're not familiar with the play Honor, uh, we use the term Honor because that's what the whole the duel of 1802 was all about. It looks at the duel between uh, John Stanley, who was a hot-tempered congressman and uh, Richard Dobbs Spade, who was a hot-tempered former congressman who'd been beaten the race by John Stanley. And uh, Mr. Spade was also known because he was one of the signers of the U.S. Constitution. In fact, he was the youngest man to sign the, the picture. If you've ever seen that famous picture of it's in, what is it, in the Capitol building of the signing of the Constitution, uh, he is the guy standing at the table signing, signing the paper. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was also the first native-born governor of North Carolina. That is true. Yes, that's, that's right. Uh, his, his parents came across with uh, Arthur Dobbs, the governor Arthur Dobbs. Yes. And uh, Arthur Dobbs was, in fact, his godparent when his parents both, when uh, Richard Dobbs Bates' parents both died and left him an orphan around age eight or nine or so. So it's a very, very fascinating story. Uh, you want to fill us in a little bit on the assignment on, on the duel itself? The uh, politics and, and so absolutely, forth. Uh, it, absolutely, it, it's a it, it, it's the whole idea is that this story so closely resembles the political situation of today. Absolutely, the um, it was a very divisive period in American politics because having gained uh, independence and uh, George Washington had command of the army, uh, and, which was a miracle in itself, and so he was uh, a clear and obvious choice to be to be a, the political leader. Uh, going forward as uh, as an independent country, so he you know he served, and then John Adams was um, sort of his anointed, appointed successor. They they voted on it, but but he was a, a clear fault follower. But then during Adams' presidency, there grew much larger, looming questions about the degree of how 
how unified a union this was really going to be, and the issue of states' rights versus um, versus federal control of all sorts of things, from finance to uh, taxation, uh, arose. And so, uh, by 1799, you have uh, Adams, uh, who who is uh, a federalist, and you have Jefferson, who's more of a states' right rights person. And they differed on other issues too. Adams wanted a navy and built a navy. Uh, Jefferson thought a navy wasn't necessary, that all we needed were some harbor defense boats. Um, and so that 1799 election was very acrimonious. Uh, and it, this is a period when dueling was popular in Europe as well, among high-toned gen gentlemen of, of, of a certain amount of wealth. I think it's interesting, it was a time when people did a lot of high-stakes gambling as well. Mm -hmm. And I have, I have a personal theory that, that people who uh, did a lot of high stakes gambling may have have entertained the idea of dueling to, to defend their honor as sort of an extension of uh, for the of gamble, that. right, right, the, the ultimate gamble with your with your life, all for the sake of your honor. And uh, I find it interesting looking at duels in that period around 1800 in the United States. How many of them were fought between? Federalists and Jeffersonians. Yes, and uh, now Mr. Spade had started out as a Federalist himself, mm -hmm. and then he changed parties, very possibly over the Alien and Seditions Act, which we won't go into, but it was a uh, very awkward moment of the time. <laughs> we could do a whole show just talking about the Alien and Seditions oh, Act. Absolutely. And meanwhile, Mr. Jefferson himself was um, Mr. Jefferson. Mr. Stanley was with the opposing party, and uh, part of part of their debate over the politics of it, over over the race, was uh, Stanley accusing Spate of not truly, in heart, having changed his politics, but he only did it for political convenience. Yeah, I remember when I when you and I both worked at the palace, mm -hmm. reading that, thinking there had to be more to it than that. And I had already found in the the, the duel that Decatur, the, the naval officer, mm -hmm. lost his life, and lots of others. That the the uh, the fundamental difference between mm -hmm. combatants often was that question of where they fell on the Adams Jefferson uh, Federalist versus versus uh, mm -hmm. Jeffersonian uh, issue. And so, and then discover. I remember, I remember, I was sitting sitting in my office, not far from where Emmeline Piggott was was imprisoned, uh, and finally making this uh, great aha that the Stanleys were uh -huh. federalists, and that that Spate, by the time the duel was fought, was mm -hmm. was, was a Jeffersonian. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Um, now, that, that duel, I mean, it's you look in the books about dueling and so on, and the most you're going to find is a little footnote about this particular duel, and yet I think it was one of the more important duels in the country, deserved greater um, recognition. It, it preceded the uh, more famous duel of Hamilton and Burr by two years, and I believe uh, John Stanley must have been a friend or at least a great admirer of Hamilton because he named one of his kids <coughs> after him. Um, but the duel was unique in that usually a duel happens, such as the Hamilton Burr duel. Uh, Hamilton's wife did not know until after he was shot that there was even a duel. These things tended to happen right now, and you slipped out in the early morning, not even telling your family about it. You went out and you had your bang bang fest, and uh, afterwards, whether anybody died or not. And there's a whole set of rules on how a duel goes, and maybe down the road we'll talk about that. But in this case, these guys screamed and yelled at each other in print for days, and that's what led up to it. Until finally, so the whole town knew about it, the whole town turned out. Uh, now, Pear has played Mr. Spate in the past, and is very yes. likely to again. And uh, so, so what were your thoughts on this character when you performed him? Um, he was obviously... A very, a very complex man, but but also uh, uh, he had a very short fuse uh, because of his honor. Mm -hmm. Honor was everything. Honor. Uh, he was a uh, you know, signer of the uh, Constitution. He'd been a governor. Uh, he'd held public office. And uh, this young whippersnapper uh, disrespected him. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no way that Stanley was going to get away with that. Uh, despite the fact that his wife was telling him, you know, this is crazy. Uh, and, and he kept assuring her that, you know, according to the rules, you know, we shoot in the air, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, 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 you know, everything will be fine. But uh, 
but uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's clear that Stanley and Spate just hated each other. They hated each other, and I think during the course of the duel, mm-hmm. they reloaded. What was it? Four times. Four times. There were four, four times before finally somebody I hit mean, somebody. Yeah, that they were they were out they were out to get each other, and uh, uh, yeah, there's even one point where the. Uh, crowd was begging them to stop, and uh, Mr. Graham, who was uh, John Stanley's second, threatened to shoot anybody if he didn't shut up and let the fight go on. That's yeah. right. That's right. That's yeah. extraordinary, cause, because in uh, there's a tradition in dueling, the seconds are supposed to try to get the, the combatants to, to, to shake hands and there's a whole prescribed way. Yeah, it is to, honor declared, it's yeah. honor declared. And especially after an exchange of shots, uh, to say, well, gentlemen, has mm-hmm. your honor been satisfied? And clearly, Stanley was just determined. He was he was either going to kill or be killed. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's a little bit out of the uh, out, out of the ordinary for him. Yeah. Okay, I think we're going to take a little break here, if that's all right. Uh, when we come back, we have a special guest who I see has dropped in on us, and we'll pop out of a duel for a few minutes and and talk to General Tom Broughton. We'll I like right that. Back. I like that popping out of a duel. Yes. In, in, <laughs> in, in, <laughs> <laughs> Toyota of Newburn wants your vehicle. Your car is worth more than ever now, no matter the year, make, or model. We'll pay you top dollar for it, no matter what you still owe. Even if you don't buy from us, your vehicle will never be worth more than it is now. Get paid to trade today with Toyota of Newburn. Toyota of Newburn. Looking for a total experience of dining and entertainment? We've got the biggest selection of craft beer, outdoor games, and live entertainment in the area. Come on in, we've got something for everyone. Come drink and dine with that delicious food. Live entertainment that's just right for you. With outdoor space and games to please your crew. Tap that craft beer and wine, we'll see you soon. Good morning again, everyone. Uh, my name is Perry Erickson. I'm uh, Vice President of the uh, North Carolina History Theater. I'm here with uh, Bill Hand, Simon Spaulding, and we have a guest that has, has uh, joined us, uh, retired Marine Major General uh, Thomas Bratton uh, has joined us, uh, very, very kindly uh, uh, taken some time out of a very busy day. Uh, I understand you're going over to River Bend to dedicate a memorial there. 
and uh, I'm sure you've got a lot of things on your uh, on your plate today. So uh, welcome, welcome to our to our program. Well, General. thank you. Pleasure to be yeah, here. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and could you could you tell us uh, some of the things that you're uh, that you're going to be doing today? Well, I had breakfast at Epiphany this morning. They uh, invited all veterans to come over there and have breakfast, and the kids served because the cl- school is closed. But they had pancake breakfast, which is a very nice way to start the day. And then I have my uh, flight surgeon from Vietnam who's visiting, spending the night with us. So wow. uh, actually right now he's getting a haircut next door because he uh-huh. said he needed that more than he needed to talk here. Uh, and then we're going to go down to Union Point and take a look at all the flags that the Vietnam veterans have put out over there. Uh, it was a big lunch today at Temple Church. So we're going to go over there and have that and, uh, uh, and then do a little reflecting. Yes. You just yeah. have to sit yes. back and think. And then I'm going to go to Union Point at about 6 and greet the mm-hmm. walkers. Yes. We were we supposed to get yes. there around 6 or 6.30, somewhere yes. in there. Mm-hmm. And they're going to be flat, tired by the time they're 22 miles is a long yeah, walk. Walking yeah. from starting in Maysville and ending at Union Point. Yeah. yeah. And and this, is the, uh, this is the uh, 22 for 22 March. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Could you explain that? Uh, I don't know all their details, but I know they're trying to help because there's still, there's a fair, not a fair, a large number of veterans who commit suicide. Yes, and uh, this is an effort to raise some money and just uh-huh. and raise some awareness of the fact that that we have so many of these guys who have uh, problems of some sort that drive them to the point to where they take their lives. So they're going to walk in their twenty two miles, twenty two pounds in a backpack they're wearing. Mm-hmm. Now and, the last uh, leg of the trip is going to be down Pollock Street. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And, and, and they're uh, going to so, pick up as they come because they know every not everybody can walk 22 miles. That's right. a long walk. So anybody who wants to come out and uh, help cheer them on their last uh, yep. mile or so, get out on Pollock Street and be waiting for them and cheer them as they go by. And they're picking up another smaller group in mm-hmm. Pollocksville and then some more as they go along. So mm-hmm. you, you don't have to walk the whole 22 miles, right. which if you did, you would already be four hours into it because they met there at 4.30 <laughs> this morning. It's a long well, walk. I run is. marathons, and that takes yeah, yeah. a long time to run 26, but but yeah. to walk it in in, mm-hmm. in a group and toting a backpack. Now, on the flags down at Union Point, and it, it's an impressive sight, and they've it down is. there by the pavilion, there's just rows upon rows, hundreds of flags that people have uh, purchased for the, for the flying in honor of any kind of veteran. And that is wrapping up, I believe, this morning. They'll be pulling them up around 10 or so. So if y'all want to go down and catch that site, it's well worth going down and seeing. You might, uh, as soon as the show is over, hop in your car, uh, get on your bicycle, get down there and take a look. Yeah, they were hoping to get 900 flags, and they were at 800 some two days ago. So my guess is they probably got to the 900, which is, which is good. This is a, it's a great community because they really treat the veterans well. They, they take care of them. At, at their breakfast this morning, the CEO of Cherry Point was there because his kids go to Epiphany. The new assistant city manager was there. A couple of uh, the county commissioners mm-hmm. and aldermen were over there. So they, they look around and try to touch all the veterans and, and just take care of them, which mm-hmm. is neat. Yeah, we're yep. a curious community. We're very artsy and we're also very patriotic. And uh, you don't always see those two together, but uh, that's true. This is a community that strongly supports the arts and strongly supports. We the do military. have a little bit of arts around here and here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes and, uh, well, this gentleman, I, I kill him on stage a lot every time we're yes, that's playing my, together. Uh, that's he, my I, he either starts out and he's uh, dead by the end of the season. I'm, he's I'm, a, I'm, Pear is an amazing actor. He's one of yes. the best actors in in this. Well, I'd say in Craven County, but he's actually a Pamlico man. But uh, in I'm, in the area, I'm the best actor in Pamlico County. There you go. Uh, we'll go with and that. He, and he dies very well. He yes, dies absolutely, amazingly absolutely. well. Absolutely, every yeah. every single time. And, and quickly, quickly come back too. Yeah, yeah quickly, <laughs> slowly. I've, yeah. I've knocked him off both ways. That's my <laughs> stick. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm I so impressed the fact that you're getting the North Carolina History Theater going again. I think that's just that's neat, and to see. Uh, shows like yeah. Honor brought back. I mean, that's impressive. Uh, Mark Twain, all those kinds of things yeah, are, it's, they're, they're really neat, and it makes this community mm-hmm. special. Yeah, when, when you see a story presented, a piece of history presented as a story rather than just reading from a textbook, it, it stays with you. Yep. And uh, a huge amount of research went into that play, by the way. Uh, we've been asked that's how good. much of it we made up, and well, conversations are invented obviously because we don't have a conversation between the husband and wife in the parlor but everything is based on absolute fact everything that happens in it did indeed happen in life yes and, and you, but, you actually uh, used 
the exchange of letters between uh, between Stanley yes, we, and uh, we found and the state. whole letters and yeah. flyers that they printed yeah. back and forth uh, at yeah. one of the university libraries and I managed to uh, photograph That's each true. page and come home and typeset them all and 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 a lot of that it, those letters come up in the play quoted word for word you yeah. know I, yeah. I had to I had to memorize them word for word yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Yeah, but I had to sit there and, and suffer through a memorization process with you. So well, the good thing is he, he gets to forget him when he dies. So yes, <laughs> then you have to remember again the next day. That's, that's, right. Right. that's the upside. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. All right. Well, um, the general Robin, we we uh, thank you very much for what you've done for this country. You My pleasure. Up there. How long were you in charge over there, at Cherry Point? Uh, three years there, and that ended my career was a little over 36 years. So that, the okay. last three were great because I get to meet all the fine people in this this whole area, Pamlico included. You, you and, found uh, one of the finest spots in the country to retire. Well, you know, it's, it's funny, but people say, gee, this is uh, North Carolina is the f- most friendly military place. It, it may be. I can't speak to that. But I can tell you in all the places I was at, I've never found a place that was more supportive and friendly and uh, and interested in taking care of the the service mm-hmm. members that are here than this area right here. I mean, it really is incredible. Well, we're, we're very thankful for everything that they do. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're going to turn now to, uh, we're going to come back to Simon here for a few minutes. We're going to close this lid because for all I know, it's in the picture. Um, <laughs> and Simon is, uh, I've been to this guy's house, and he has a, a huge, huge room in the house. It's about as big as our living room, probably bigger. And it is lined wall to wall with instrumentation, instruments of <laughs> guitars and uh, violins and, and curious, strange things like the thing he's holding right now. And he is a, a collector of fascinating instruments, and he plays them all. He's going to talk a little bit about this uh, giant pipe with the strings on it that he's uh, about to play for us and tell us about it. it <laughs> so, so it's all yours, Simon. All right. So uh, Bill asked me to bring something interesting. This is an arhu from China, and uh, it's a kind of Chinese two-stringed fiddle. Looks a bit like a croquet mallet, uh, but the body is hollow. It has a soundboard of snakeskin, Burmese python. Since 1988, they only use farm, farmed pythons, not wild ones. Uh, and stretched very tight. Then it has two strings, which used to be of silk. These days, they usually of steel. Uh, with a bow of bamboo, with rosin horse hair, just like a violin bow has. But the hair of the bow is captured between the two strings. So you press the bow towards you to play on the low string. <laughs> and away from you to play on the high string. That gives you two notes, and then you can press the strings just lightly with your finger. There's no frets, no no fingerboard, but by pressing the strings lightly with your fingers, you can get more notes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So can you play us a little tune now? Absolutely. Our producer back there just rocking away and going back. He's going to fall off the chair in a minute back there. Uh, great piece. What, what what number is that? I'm I have a funny feeling that it's not a traditional Chinese folk song. Uh, no, I know. I recognize it, but I don't know it. Like, but uh, I started off with an Irish slide from County Kerry, the southwest of Ireland, wow. and I followed with a uh, a Scottish fiddle tune, a Miss McLeod Rasse, 
which is one of the tunes brought by uh, Scottish and Scots Irish immigrants uh, to North Carolina, and it's also mm-hmm. part of the uh, part of the North Carolina fiddle repertoire. Yeah, okay, now now us. Simon, by the way, is the uh, musician who wrote the music for the play we're doing honor and uh, he included a number of traditional tunes we'll be adding another traditional tune this year that's right um and i can i know the tune i can never remember the name uh free america free america it was, it was a rallying song during the war of independence okay so and uh, everyone will know about when you hear it that uh, he also runs a band for the show a band of Three last year. I think you're thinking of adding a, a fourth instrument next time around. Yeah, planning planning to do that. All right, so pit, pit orchestra. So that we weren't in the pit, we were, we were yeah. on stage. <laughs> yeah, so we do hope we see you all at tryouts and uh, mm-hmm. come on out, see you, see you, if you want to fit into an 1802 society. We need lots of people because we're, we have a whole town on the show, and so five or six people do not make a town. So, so we want lots of people for that. By the way, it is national, not only is it Veterans Day, but this is incredibly vital to you all, it is National Sunday Day. <laughs> so everybody run down to uh, the local ice cream shop and, and celebrate. It, national Sunday Day, because I know you all really want to know, happened in the late 1800s. The first Sunday was made in Ithaca, New York. I can't imagine someone somewhere didn't think of throwing chocolate on a glob of ice cream before that, but officially that's where the first advertisement for the ice cream sundae comes. So make sure you all are going out there and uh, celebrating that amazing day. Pear, tell us what else is going on in town here. Well, we've we've got uh, uh, quite a lot going on uh, here um, in town, and it, it always amazes me how many things are actually going on in uh, New Bern. Uh, I used to live up near Philadelphia, and we have never been so active anywhere as we've been since we moved down here. It's just, it's just incredible. Uh, playing right now at the uh, New Bern Civic Theater is a production of Rock of Ages, which I understand is, uh, is uh, really, really successful. I have a couple of friends mm-hmm. who've, uh, who have, who've, who've gone there. And, yeah, and before you take family to it, it is R-rated. It so is R-rated. So give that warning. Yes, do, not, yes. do not bring your little toddler That's right. Along. And it's, uh, it takes you back to the time of big bands with big egos playing big guitar solos and sporting even bigger hair. Uh, bands like Night Ranger, Oreo, Speedwagon, Pat Benatar, and my favorite, Twisted Sister. Uh, so that's uh, <laughs> Rock of Ages, uh, November 12th, 13th, 14th, 19th, and 20th. My wife and I are going there on Sunday. Uh, and tickets are very hard to get. Uh, anyway. Um, the Down East Dance will be presenting the Nutcracker. Uh, that's always a, a holiday favorite. Um, and uh, this play takes place also at uh, the Athens, the historic Athens Theater, which is, the, of course, the New Bern Civic Theater uh-huh. in downtown. And that'll take place uh, on uh, Fridays, December 3rd and 10th, Saturdays, December 4th and 11th, uh, and, uh, and Sundays, December 5th and 12th. Uh, so uh, get your tickets for that at the New Bern Civic Theater, Theater box office or at newburncivictheater.org. Rivertown Players is putting on Sister Act, uh, which, is a, which is a fun, uh, uh, it was a great movie uh, starring Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, and they're going to be putting that on in, uh, on December 3rd, 4th, 5th, 10th, 11th, 12th, 17th, and 18th at Rivertown on Hancock Street. Uh, and on December 18th, uh, Lewis and Clark, uh, this is a uh, New Bern's very own world-traveling husband and wife duo, uh, will be presenting a program also at the Civic Theater on uh, December 18th. Uh, uh, this will be a, a musical expedition through classic Christmas songs and stories featuring fantastic ballroom dance stylings of River to- Town ballrooms, Bernie Mallon, and Ania Leroy. And let us, we forget, on December 11th and December 18th, the Tryon Palace will be uh, presenting its, uh, its famed uh, Palace Candlelight uh, event. Uh, this did not take place last year because of, because of COVID. 
Uh, so it's uh, returning this year uh, uh-huh. with beautiful new decorations, heartwarming holiday vignettes illuminated by the magical blow, glow of candlelight. And lots of uh, colonials yes. walking around telling you their story. And, uh, exactly. It, it's, a, it's a fascinating night to spend. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And uh, this, this uh, candlelight uh, is a site-wide event for Tryon Palace. It includes tours of the palace. And if you've never been to the Tryon Palace, you must go. It is a, uh, an amazing place. Also, we'll be touring, they'll be touring the Stanley House, the Dixon House, and other activities on the uh, grounds. And uh, the gates open at 4.30 p.m. Again, that's December 11th and December 18th. Okay, and also don't forget, tomorrow, November 12th, is the Art Walk that takes place downtown from 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. If you want to see some great artwork, artists, as they are working, uh, come on downtown and take a look at that. And this Sunday, uh, Sam Lewis and company are doing a free concert at Riverside United Methodist Church. That's uh, this coming Sunday, the 14th at 3 mm-hmm. in the afternoon. It's free and uh, should be a lot of fun. Okay, so if you're one of these people sitting around saying, I'm living in this little town and there's just nothing happening, it's because <laughs> you're not looking, people. There is a lot happening. Yeah, and uh, no matter what your tastes are, I think you can find something to, uh, to keep you happy. So uh, we're, we're getting close here. Yes. Yes. Um, doing my research for uh, uh, Veterans Day, I came across this strange little factoid that uh, uh, following the outbreak of World War II, um, the idea of commemorating Armistice Day sort of fell out of favor uh, with a small group of Americans, a very small group, thankfully. Uh, they proposed that Armistice Day be officially renamed replaced by Mayflower Day. Yes, <laughs> General, you're closing and your we, eyes. We see that <laughs> yes. in the book, sir. We see yes, that yes. in the book. Yes. <laughs> to, commemorate, to commemorate the signing of the Mayflower Compact, which took place on November 11th, 1620. Mm-hmm. Uh, fortunately, this, uh, this uh, particular idea that went Precisely nowhere. Uh, <laughs> good place for it. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> that was a good thing. That was a good thing. Yes. That's right. Yes. It's so, amazing how some things change over time, and uh, some for the better, and some for the. <laughs> you were mentioning things that happen, and normally mm-hmm. this time of year we do a uh, naturalization ceremony, but because right. of COVID we couldn't do it, and that's normally in the Tryon Palace in the Col- Coleman Hall uh-huh. there, uh, which is neat, and it's fun to talk to people who worked really hard to become citizens. Mm-hmm. Some of them spent five or six years in a camp in a neighboring country where they were, and then they finally get to the U.S., and then they study for two or three years, and they become a citizen. And to hear their stories is just, Mm -hmm. uh, it's great. So next year, we're hopeful that we'll bring that back again. And the the other fun Mm -hmm. part is a lot of them are active-duty military folks. Oh, okay. Who Very joined good. the yep. military, and that's yep. how they got ready for their citizenship, yeah, which is a really I've covered thing. a few of those events for uh, one of my son's journal days, and yep. uh, they've, they've always been very impressive. Those people are amazingly happy and proud yeah, was, uh, to, to yeah. enter their new country. I, I'm, I myself am a naturalized citizen. So, uh, yes, yes. And, uh, From Norway? Yes. And, uh, yeah, we came over in 1950, uh, and... Uh, um, uh, in Philadelphia, they have these wonderful ceremonies that actually uh, take place in Independence Hall, where the Constitution was signed, and they usually have a uh, federal judge that comes in from the Eastern District of Pennsylvania uh, who uh, presides at it. And it's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful ceremony uh, right there in the place where the Constitution mm-hmm. was uh, was uh, was hammered out and eventually signed. Another interesting uh, veteran fact, I had breakfast this morning at Epiphany, like I mentioned, with the with a wife and children of my former aide, and uh, he enlisted or took the oath of office on the USS Constitution. Wow. And when uh, he made colonel, I went up and promoted him in front of the Constitution in Washington, D.C. Wow. So, so things, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's just, there's wow. amazing yeah. facts about people who really do love the country. Okay, well, folks, we are there. It's just about a little less than a minute before the hour of 9 o'clock. Volume 1, Episode 1, a gathering of very fine people from North Carolina History Theater podcast or vlogcast. Or, well, I think we're a podcast, right? 
I, I don't know. I'm uh, one of these people that uh, I'm, I'm just here. Computers were an accident that I had to learn in this whole technology. But anyway, we're glad you could join us. Special thanks to uh, Tom, to uh, Simon, and to Kathy, who is no longer among us. She's among the living. Don't worry about that. She's just no longer among us right here. And uh, pair my co-host and thank me too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Bill. Thank and you, Bill. We'll see you in another week. All right. Bye bye.